thing he didn't like was the fact that modern civilization is completely material. It's everything is based on how much we have, how much we possess. For example, all of you as MBA students, I think the question in your minds of uppermost will be, what salary am I going to get when I finish this course? So everything today we measure in terms of money. If you see that someone is very successful, you say, oh, he has a big car, he has a big bungalow. All of success is measured in those terms. Even in the villages, sometimes when you go to the villages near Kodikan and you ask the women there, uh, somebody has gone to the hospital, they have uh, had an operation and come back. They don't tell you that that operation was successful or not. They tell you, Iruvadairava salap pannan. So everything is measured in terms of money. That is the world we are living in today. Is this the kind of world that Gandhi wanted to see? Not at all. Gandhi wanted a world in which all of us have just enough to meet our basic needs. Where we live simple lives. Where we don't need many clothes. For example, I think everybody in this room, particularly perhaps the girls, each of us will have 20, 30 sets of clothes. And today that's a thought to be the norm. In anybody's home, if you go, and especially women, you look at the bureaus, you find that 20 saris, 30 saris, 40 saris. And just two generations back, I remember my grandmother's time, any house, even a well-to-do house, had only three saris. There was, no one needed more. There was absolutely no need for more clothes. But today we all want to have so many. Similarly, the boys are exactly the same. We all want to change our mobile phone every two years. We all want to have more and more goods. Is this the goal of all our lives? Is the question that Gandhi asked. He said your goal should be self-development, spiritual development, or even if you're interested in science or technology, to create something new, or if you're good managers, to manage a good institution. These are the kinds of goals that you should have, and not the acquisition of material goods. In today's world, everything around us makes us want to acquire material goods. And that was something Gandhi did not like at all. If you read that book by Gandhi in 1909, he, didn't, he talked a lot against machinery. And so today also people think that Gandhi is anti-machinery. The reason why Gandhi was anti-machinery at that time, and he qualified it later in many ways, but he was basically saying, why do we have machinery? Can any of you tell me why we should have machinery? Why do we need machinery? Anybody? What do we need machinery for? Reduce? Reduce manpower. Absolutely correct. And that was exactly what Gandhi did not want. He said in a poor country like India, where your main problem is giving jobs to everybody, why do you want to reduce manpower? So he questioned the basis of having machinery. He always said that it's good if you have machinery which can improve efficiency, or if it you can give, which can give you better goods. But don't just bring in machinery because it reduces manpower, because that is not needed in a country like India. So he questioned the basis on which you take certain decisions. For example, he said we don't need railways. And everybody said, what is this man talking, we don't need railways? Surely railways are excellent things. And then there was someone who wrote an article against Gandhi, this was in 1910, saying that because we have railways, now we can travel from Madras to Bombay, and at that time, in two days, we could travel. Otherwise, it would have taken months. This is surely progress. And he also said, and that in the same article is written that, now it is possible to bring goods from Bombay to Madras and take goods from Madras to Bombay. Gandhi had only one reply. He, tell, he said, why do you want to go to Bombay? This question is simple. If you're in Madras, why do you want to go to Bombay? Why this craze to travel? If, you have a, if you're able to have a job in Madras itself, is there any need for people to madly travel from place to place? Similarly, he said that if you have self-sufficient economies, if you have industries in Madras using raw material from Madras, you don't need to take raw material from Bombay and bring it to Madras. You don't need to take material from Madras and take it to Bombay. So he said there was basically no new need for railways. Later on, he qualified it to say that the only two reasons why you can have railways or if you want to go in a, on a pilgrimage, or if you want to go for tourism. Otherwise, he said, why do you need railways? So in everything, Gandhi questioned the basis of things we take for granted today. Similarly, Gandhi was against lawyers. Why was he against lawyers? He himself was a lawyer for that matter, and the entire leadership of the Congress were lawyers. Yet he said, no, the lawyers are there because lawyers have a vested interest 
in a problem. In any village, if you go, if someone has a problem with the neighbor, let's say over construction of some wall, today what happens? One will file a case against the other and go to the police station, file an FIR or something, and the police stations are all corrupt, so you give some money to make them file an FIR, then the other person goes and gives more money, then a case is filed finally, and it goes on for 10 years, and finally both families are ruined because of the case. Gandhi said, why don't you do it the way we used to do it in the old days? Call a small council of elders, panchayat leaders, uh, the elders of the community, make, make them sit together under the uh, banyan tree in front of the temple and ask them to say who is right and who is wrong. Normally in a village, everybody knows who is right and who is wrong. Now you've created this group of people called lawyers who are able to create an entire system of courts and police and law which keeps them in business but makes everybody poor, whoever goes to the law courts. So he was against them. He was against doctors. Why can any, how can anybody be against doctors? Surely doctors are needed. Especially Gandhi because he had an appendicitis operation once and he used doctors only. Doctors only did the operation for him. Yet Gandhi has spent so much time writing against doctors. Can anybody guess as to why Gandhi wrote against doctors? Anybody? Sorry? No, he mainly wrote against Western doctors, allopathic medicine. And he wrote against them because he gave one very nice example. He said that, I go to a party, I overeat, lots I overeat. Next day I'm very sick, so I go to the doctor. The doctor gives me a medicine. I become alright within 12 hours. I immediately go to another party and overeat again. So he says the cycle goes on and on and on because doctors are there. In the old days, Gandhi used to say, if a person overate, he would have severe pain for three days or four days, he would go home, he would lie in a corner, and after that he would never overeat again. But now, because doctors are there, you are able to constantly have the cycle of indulgence, doctors, indulgence, doctors. And that he said was completely wrong. So what he said, Gandhi's view of doctors was that doctors should only play a role of advisors. They should check everything about you and give you advice on what is the best way to live, what suits you, what doesn't suit you. They should not perform any, med any treatment on you, they should not give you any medicines. But as I said later, Gandhi himself, uh, all these, Gandhi took these positions to make people think. Overall he said yes, for certain kinds of things like fractures or appendicitis, you do need doctors. Now what, what is it that we can learn from Gandhi? So these are all the things he was against. But there are lots of things that Gandhi said was for, which I think we can learn a lot from. And let me look at some of the things that we can learn from. Firstly, his work ethic. We think that if you are going to be managers, you will need to work very hard. Or if you are going to be IS officers also, you will have to work very hard. Gandhi was one person who every day used to begin his work day at 3.45 in the morning. Even on the last day when he was killed in Delhi, he was awake at 3.45 in the morning. And from 3.45 in the morning, he'd begin working. And he'd work almost continuously. He'd take breaks when he was he needed to sleep a little during the daytime. He needed to have a kind of mud pie bath, which he used to have almost daily. But apart from that, right up to the time he went to sleep, he would just work. That kind of work ethic, I think we can all imitate. And I think it's very difficult for all of us to do. And 3.45 was only towards the end. Earlier, when he was in Naukali in, in Bengal, in the, when the, all the communal violence was going on, he used to get up at 2.45 in the morning. And at that time he was 78 years old. So at 78 he had the capacity to begin work at 2.45 in the morning and continue till night. That kind of work ethic we all need in whichever profession we go into. Because only then can we achieve something. I don't know if any of you have ever seen 2.45 in the morning. I haven't. Or 3.45 or 4.45. Most of us are used to getting up around 6 or more. But I think Gandhi is a good example of how we can slowly stretch the amount of time which is available to us. Not just work ethics, punctuality. Gandhi was a stickler for punctuality. If it was 3 o'clock, it, it had to be 3. And he used to have this prayer meeting every day in the evening at 5 o'clock. And if anybody disturbed him at that 5 o'clock time, he would just not give them any attention, even if it was Patel or Nehru or anybody. He'd rush for this prayer meeting. On the last day when he was killed, and he was killed at the prayer meeting, he was talking to Patel, and it became 5-2, five, 5-3, five, 
and he was getting restless and his nieces who were there with him, they kept on showing him the watch saying, get up. Finally, 